uh, real honor uh, for not me, all of us, uh, to have Mike Mullen here as our guest. Uh, we won't do the whole biography. It's almost unique that uh, uh, Admiral Mullen was one of the very few military officers ever to hold four different four-star assignments as Vice Chief of Naval Operations, as Commander of uh, European Fleet in Naples, which is where I first got to know him while I was serving in Rome. Uh, then as Chief of Naval Operations, and then four years as uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. More important than the titles, uh, Mike Mullen was already known, was always known as someone who cared about his people, about the servicemen and women serving under him, and showed it in ways large and small. Uh, he played a crucial role as chairman of the Joint Chiefs in opening up military service as an option uh, to Americans who had formerly been excluded, uh, improving the diversity and inclusivity and strength and cohesion of our armed services, uh, and who also epitomized the term warrior diplomat, uh, a partner with the State Department in negotiations uh, with the Russians. Uh, and while there are lots of things I'd love to ask you about, whether it was growing up in Hollywood or your favorite restaurants in Naples, I think we're going to do <laughs> nuclear weapons today. There's a, uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of concern, uh, as we heard on an earlier panel, about the overall state of U.S.-Russian relations and how it is affecting stability between our two countries, how it is impacting our uh, dialogue and almost negating our dialogue with the Russian Federation. So maybe we could start there as both an arms control and a military issue with the INF Treaty about to go away in response to a new weapon that the Russians have deployed. Uh, what military steps make sense to counter a new Russian capability aimed at European cities? Uh, and is there a military value to the US building intermediate range missiles for use either in Europe or in Asia? Well, thanks, Tom, and thanks to you and all of you who are working these issues. Tom made the point just before we started uh, this afternoon that uh, the room the, that used to house this association's annual meeting has gotten too small, uh, and it you, you needed a bigger place. And, and so I appreciate all of you who are focused on this issue. Uh, part of me wishes I didn't even have to be here. Uh, and part of me wishes that you didn't need a room this big. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to your question on the INF piece, but what I worry about is we're sort of on this road now that I thought we had closed off. Uh, and when you look at the issues as they are returning, INF is, is an example of that. And then obviously, first time I heard anything about INF recently, uh, tied to whether or not we'd stay with it. The first thing I thought about was New Start coming up in, at its 10-year anniversary and whether that too was in jeopardy. And I would argue it seems as it is for whatever reason. Uh, um, and so it's this road that I thought we'd kind of controlled, closed off, figured out, had a way of putting aside these these strategic death weapons that would destroy all of us. Uh, and now I worry that that's a road we're back on. And it is opening up. And it's opening up for a number of reasons. <clears throat> I think there's, when I listen to people, there's, there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, but it's incredibly worrisome that we're, even, that we're even having this conversation. That said, one of my messages here is I hope that, uh, I guess it goes back for me in the two, to the 2005 time frame when I took over the Navy and I had, a, I had a group of mostly civilian volunteers who were great thinkers 
that would go off and work issues for me, and two of those thinkers were Paul Bracken and Jackie Davis, who I, in 2005, said, I haven't heard a word about deterrence since 1989 or 1990. What, what is deterrence in this century? And Paul and Jackie went off, and it was the first work I'd actually seen. It doesn't mean nobody was working on it. But it was one of those things that we, we thought had, had, uh, had passed us, and yet it was a new century. There are other threats, and so how do we think about deterrence now? Uh, I was actually thinking about it in other areas, cyber being one as an example, as opposed to back to this, but back to this, and here we are. Um, and, I, and I hope that we can figure out how to move forward uh, on that. Um, in 2005, I had no idea I'd be the chairman, and then clearly, even when I became chairman, I had no idea I'd be debating New Start. Uh, I was talking to someone earlier today. I met my Russian counterpart on the phone uh, in August of 2008 when the Russians went into Georgia. Uh, he had just he'd been in the job a month. He hadn't been in, in Moscow in a long time, so here he was in charge of a war, an invasion, and he's trying to figure out his own world. And then, ironically, two years later, I end up at the table with, uh, uh, with General Makarov negotiating the New START Treaty. Um, and I had not spent a lot of time in it up to that point, and obviously I immersed myself in it. And I thought we as two countries, including the ambassador, got that to a pretty good place. Uh, Difficult for lots of reasons. I won't go into that, but extraordinarily, uh, an extraordinarily important outcome. Um, and I had hoped, as we negotiated, set the ten years, that we would certainly carry it to the extension that we're now facing. It all happens pretty quickly. And as I look around this room, it's back to sort of experts. I don't know who the experts are anymore. I would only want everybody here who's been in this business a while to find some young people to make them as smart as you are, to make that investment through fellowships and education and, I mean, what, whatever it is, because a lot of the experts from the Soviet days are no longer with us. Many of you are a product of them, and we, I feel, have an obligation to make sure that we have a sustaining capability in this area because it appears it's not going to go away. Um, when you ask me about the INF, it's almost, I mean, to some degree, it's a tactical question for me. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, I, I have no doubt, and, and I also want to caveat what I'm saying is, uh, I will be out of that chairman's job eight years come October. Uh, and it's not like I have an office in the Pentagon anymore. <laughs> Uh, we have a way of dropping the formers off and never speaking them to them again. <laughs> and so I haven't been back much, so I'm not current on the, on the, particularly on the intelligence details here, although you can read the media pretty well and at least I can get it in the box about what's going on. It is natural for us that if we are going to, uh, if we're going to counter a weapon, if you will, we're going to develop a system to do that's what the military is going to do. We'll generate the threat requirements and do that. Exactly whether it will be symmetrical or asymmetrical is a question, and I don't have a good answer for that right now. One of the things we tried to get done in the New START treaty was uh, have a discussion about the nuclear weapons in Europe, those that aren't there and those that are there because the Russians have an overwhelming number nearby. Um, that, was a, that essentially became a non-starter in the discussion at the time. Uh, and given the focus on the strategic set, that's what we eventually both agreed that's what we'd cover. That didn't mean they're not, they're not dangerous uh, or shouldn't somehow be contained. I was struck a couple of years ago when I listened to the Russian ambassador, I think it was to Denmark, raised the issue of nuclear weapons. And, I'm in and, go, and I said, who is this guy and what is he talking about? And it is in Europe. And then I've seen President Putin, you know, he has talked about it seemingly more frequently and more frequently as time has gone on, right up to this whole INF piece. And 
I'm both concerned and paranoid enough to know that when the president of Russia <clears throat> comes out publicly and starts talking about our command centers, uh, you know, the game is changing. The game is changing, and it is really serious stuff. So, and I guess another, another training moment for me, because it was in early, I think it was in the early Bush administration, uh, and I'm a missile defense guy by trade in the Navy. Uh, I'm an Aegis guy, so I've been around the development of, of um, uh, missile defense for many, many decades. But when we uh, summarily, at some point early in the administration, walked away from the ABM treaty, I mean, that, I wasn't involved in that, but that really got my attention. And so what are treaties for? Who's going to believe? Who's going to stay with them? Uh, with a track record that sometimes we in the U.S. don't even look at ourselves in terms of our responsibility when something happens. And there were lots of reasons for it. I mean, I remember reading about that back then. When I started to hear, when, I, when INF came up, that was literally for me, that was the first thing I thought of, is we're, we're going to walk away from another treaty, uh, and then yet again another one, uh, potentially. Um, and to to, to what end? To a better outcome? And what is that outcome and how do we get there? And particularly when I was, when I was in the chairman's job, I oftentimes, I oftentimes asked that question, where are we going here, how does it end, how are we going to get there, and why are we doing this? And so a lot of those questions for me right now aren't necessarily answered either in the INF debate or in the strategic debate with New Start right around the corner that we would be developing something to counter them, that certainly uh, doesn't surprise me. And that's given permission or given the threat. And probably m most significantly given the virtual, literal, and almost complete lack of a relationship with Russia. Uh, I think it is that much more dangerous. And that goes back to, I mean, the, the empirical data now is the Bush administration trying to develop a relationship with Putin, the Obama administration trying to develop a relationship with Putin, and the current administration developing a relationship with Putin. And what does that mean? And what, where are the communication links between our two countries? Militarily, diplomatically, I actually I read in the paper this morning that, that uh, Joe Dunford, who's the current chairman, sees the Rus his Russian counterpart. Uh, in fact, it was said almost routinely like it had been going on a long time. That is not the case. It has been, and I know Dunford well enough to know, it took him a while. I think it's Grasimov, is that right? Yeah. I think it took him a while to get to a point where, and both sides agreed that they could meet. Uh, without, I'm fond of saying, even in the darkest days of the Cold War, we had lots of links with the Soviets. We don't have them now. It's not even close. And when we're talking, we're not talking. We're talking past each other. Uh, so how do we create meaningful conversations, substantive conversations, before we have to get, before we now have to meet at the table, or maybe not, maybe we don't have to do that, but let's say meet at the table and renegotiate or discuss the extension of New START. And all that groundwork that has historically been laid, it's just not there. I, I don't think it's there. Um, so it's a, it's a huge concern. So I, I'm more concerned about the INF breakdown uh, right now in terms of it representing this road back, if you will, sort of back to the future, than the tactical piece of the weapons themselves. I don't want to discount that. The weapon side of this, you know, we can figure out. I would hope we wouldn't have to spend the time and the money and the effort to do that if we can figure out a way to, to get the countries to a point where we, don't have to, where we don't have to spend that money and make that investment. Um, well, I appreciate that, and you've already touched on a, a couple of the things I wanted to ask. In particular, New START, I was, <clears throat> I am a little bit discouraged by both United States and Russian officials talking about things that have to be done first before we can get to New START extension. Uh, for a lot of us, in the absence of serious discussion, the right thing to do is just sign the damn extension. And then you can talk about things. 
Um, I take it from what you've said that you share the concern that New START might go away either because of apathy on the part of the U.S. administration uh, or because of uh, overly hard bargaining and, and posture making by both sides. Uh, if we don't have New START two years from now, uh, are there, how concerned will you be? Are there other methods to try to preserve strategic stability? One of the things as we, and we may get into this, but as North Korea certainly came to the fore and the whole nuclear weapons issue with the North Koreans, one of my worries, and I am of, I'll call myself of age now, I'm a child of the 60s and I was here for, you know, the majority of the Cold War, in fact, that's where most of my military experience is. We talk about nuclear weapons, and this is the issue with North Korea. We, we, we talk about nuclear weapons almost as if it's just a cartoon. That, I mean, I went to sea on ships. We tested nuclear weapons back then. I carried them on my ship. My first job was as an anti-submarine warfare officer and the nuclear weapons officer uh, to, and we had nuclear bombs, if you will, to go after Soviet submarines. Um, and the training that we did, the movies that we, that we used out, the, the explosions that we saw out on the atolls, much less what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it's like we've forgotten what these weapons can do. Uh, there's a great book, you'll, many of you will know it, uh, and I think it's the last train from uh, Hiroshima. Uh, and or the last train to Nagasaki, I can't remember one of the two, but it's almost a medical compendium of the damage that these weapons inflict uh, and, and the massive scale uh, that they achieve so, so quickly. And we, back to, we talk about them as almost as if they don't have that capability. We've forgotten, and Americans are pretty good at forgetting history or not somewhere between forgetting it and not knowing it as, <laughs> as we move forward. And, and I'm not, I don't want that to be overly critical. We should be mindful of history, but Americans are always moving forward, and I commend that. But this is one we should not forget, and we ought to understand the devastation levels that these weapons generate. Uh, and no kidding, it, these weapons that we, and the numbers that we negotiated right down to New START, more than ample to destroy the human race as we speak. And we don't hear many people, much less political leaders, talk about that. It's, it's to me, much more about the politics of it, which is right at the center, quite frankly, of where, in my view, where INF is and where New START could go uh, uh, because of the political environment, certainly in this country. And that has nothing to do, quite frankly, with Russia uh, at this point. Uh, certainly there's politics associated with that, but I'm just talking about our own politics. So I don't know who rises up as the expert to get this to a place that it, you know, it needs to be. This is obviously a presidential decision, as it should be, uh, and I hope we can get the right information in front of our president so that he can make the right decision and that it already hasn't been made it's just a matter of revealing it, if you will. And I hearken back to, to the ABM Treaty, that it's part of the fabric of that, uh, that view of uh, both politics and, uh, and capability, if you will, uh, that we can overcome. I, I, I worry the fact that we can just have, we have the, we're having a discussion about can we overcome these weapons, which is fundamentally it, uh, is really, really worrisome to me. So I'm, I, I, I don't think we understand the weapons well enough. I think we need to refresh, remind ourselves how devastating these and what they can do and, and align the seriousness of the discussion, the political debate, the resources, the people, and the events to that serious, devastating level of outcomes and never get there, never get there. Now, I certainly agree with you that the, the consciousness 
among the American public about the size of the weapons we're talking about. Uh, the fact that the standard weapon in the U.S. arsenal is 20 times the power of what destroyed Hiroshima. The idea that low-yield nuclear weapons are less dangerous and less likely to lead to all-out nuclear warfare uh, is uh, uh, questionable at best. Yeah. If I know that you followed as well the review, uh, the uh, release of the nuclear posture review last year. Uh, its authors uh, argued that it was not a radical change from the Obama nuclear posture review eight years prior. It did propose uh, the development of two additional sea-based low-yield nuclear capabilities. Uh, I think some of us see it as driven by America's domestic politics, but also written in the framework of credible deterrence. Uh, do you have an opinion as to whether the current U.S. nuclear capability, even before these additional low-level uh, weapons are added, uh, do we have a credible nuclear deterrent that can prevent nuclear use against the United States? Uh, the short answer to that is yes, we do. Short, you know, before these additional uh, weapons that you talk about, uh, we have enough. Uh, there's also, and again, this I think to me was very evident in the New Start debate. There, we have not invested in our arsenal to the degree that we need to to make sure that the existing arsenal is functional, technically sound, will works if we ever had it, which is so fundamental to it being a deterrent. Uh, and we can't, and, and I, then the number was, was uh, you know, hundreds of, it was billions and billions. And the Obama administration got into a big debate, in particular, uh, I think Senator Kyle was on the other side of that, yes. in terms of making sure that the billions would be part of the Obama budget. And they, they made a deal at the end uh, to generate that investment, which flat out we need, uh, as long as we have them, uh, and 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 I hope that I hope that that would continue. And if that, given that that uh, investment is being made, I think the the arsenal that we have is more than adequate. One thing, one thing about the Pentagon and weapons types, and I'm a weapons types, you know, you always want a better one. You always want more. You always want to generate, or, and I'm a requirements guy, you know, a better solution. And so there's obviously a view that some of this may help in that regard. One of it, when I think about that, I think less about, back to, back to my time as a kid, as a young ensign, and JG with these nuclear weapons on a ship going after submarines, I think that about that less now in terms of the, the, uh, the Russian submarine force than I do the Chinese force. And so there is a, you know, there is a question, and this, this was in, in my mind uh, part of New Start as well. While I was negotiating, we were negotiating with the Russians, one of the things once you get into this, and many of you have lived this, is, is as we were reducing our numbers and, and China has whatever the number is, and it's no first use, it's in it's self-defense, I get all that, but when do, we get to, when do we get to a number that's low enough where China goes, hmm, I wonder if I had to get in this game now. And you look what's happened with respect to Xi Jinping and where he seems to be taking his country in many, in many areas, particularly in the, in the area of national security, where do they go? And believe me, they're developing a lot of submarines. They're generating, building a lot of submarines. Uh, and so, again, it's sort of back to the future for me. Is this, you know, is this what I was doing in the 60s, the current, in the late 60s, you know, a current version of that to get at this kind of threat as well? Because long term, I think China's the problem. China's the threat. China's going to be the aggressor, and we're going to have to figure out how to how to push back on them pretty hard, hopefully before both of us have to make huge investments in this kind of capability with all that that entails. And if you, I get that low yield, I get the tactical, 
But if you use, if you, if we cross that, if we, if we cross that Rubicon to use a nuclear weapon of any yield, we are in a place we've not been since 1945. And then what does that mean? What permission does that give to use other weapons of higher yield, whether they are still low or whether we take them to another level? And I'm not sure we've given that a lot of thought. I'm not sure we've figured out uh, whether or not that's going to be worth it, given the longer-term implications of heading in that direction. And I know, I mean, I, I got asked not, not too long after President Trump was, I was asked a lot when President Trump was elected, t people that didn't even know what the football was all of a sudden were getting smart on the football and saying, walk me through, would you walk me through what happens, you know, with the football? And, and it, was a, it was a bit of a, uh, you know, sort of an on-off for me. I spent, so I was there 2007 to 2011, I spent so little time on the nuclear weapons uh, uh, part of the portfolio that people were doing that, and I was comfortable we were in a good place. That, I mean, I literally had to walk my, I had to do the calculus to say, okay, here's what happens with that. But it wasn't like I was doing this monthly or quarterly practicing as we, as we did many years ago. Now, that's very much back in trying to understand that, first of all. And also, it has not been overly, didn't, wasn't overly emphasized in my senior life, even as I was chairman, as we watched our Air Force go through the you know, uh, the two big events that we had, one was shipping missiles from, from uh, Minot to Barksdale, and the other was shipping parts to Taiwan, which were much more reflect indicative and reflective of the lack of attention to this as a priority as we were continuing to shift away from the Cold War. Now all of that's got to be put back in play. And so for us in the military, that means we've got to train people, hire them, pay them, keep them, where's the technology, where's the expertise, how are we going to operate these, really as a part of this deterrence package. <clears throat> Let's uh, switch topics a little bit, but stay on the subject of uh, crossing a nuclear red line and what it means. A lot of us watched with great apprehension as India and Pakistan shot at each other across the border uh, just two months ago. I know that you uh, worked hard to build the best possible relationship between the U.S. military and the government and military of Pakistan. How concerned were you as you watched this from a distance, and can the U.S. do more to draw down the tensions between two nuclear armed states? I won't tell you how much of my life I devoted to trying to draw, you know, uh, detention that issue with Pac between Pakistan and India, and uh, I still I'm still of a mind that with the nuclear weapons capability that Pakistan has, and I've said this many times. I think while we focus on Iran, we focus on North Korea, a lot of other things. I think Pakistan is the most dangerous country in the world because they have this wicked uh, brew of no economy, corrupt politicians. The military runs the place, by and large, certainly on the national security side. This seemingly uh, insoluble India-Pakistan which relationship, which I put at the core of which is at Kashmir. So one of the interesting things that came out of the action uh, in February was it's all about Kashmir. It took me a long time to believe, come to believe that was the case. I was fo focused on many terrorist organizations that resided in the west of Pakistan, and in their own way, everybody in the Pakistani military would look at me sideways and saying, what is it you don't understand about India? Uh, so it's all India, and I thought what Modi did, not Modi, sorry, what Singh did after Mumbai in 2008, which was not retaliate, and what Khan did the other day by returning that Indian pilot just took the air out of it. At and both of them, Singh in particular, because you may or may not remember, his party was just was coming up for re-election in the next few months. And of course, the drums were beating 
because of what happened in Mumbai, and some would argue rightfully so, I was there shortly after that happened, and yet Singh called it off. And that was a bold political move, as it was the other day when Khan did that. I don't know how this comes out. It is something that has worried me a great deal. About a year ago or 18 months ago, I, re I got involved in a war game. I I'm, so I'm on the board of Sam Nunn's Nuclear Threat Initiative, uh, and Ernie Moniz has taken that over. Uh, and it's a very critical group from my point of view in this business, sometime flying under the radar over a long period of time to sustain the kind of intellectual, diplomatic, personal engagement relationship exchange that needs to exist in this particular area. And we had a war game, that um, uh, we ran a war game, and what struck me was the number of uh, Chinese that were at the table. So one of the things, one of the costs of ignoring Pakistan uh, is that unattended to, and they have been for seven or eight years, and they're not an easy, they're, they're not an easy customer, uh, believe me. Um, but one of the costs of that is they drift under the umbrella of China. Uh, and I would much rather, as in most decisions, I would much rather make a conscious decision because then I know where I stand and I can sort of map out a strategy that, okay, we're going to just let that relationship evolve and we're going to not pay attention to Pakistan. When a lot of people in Pakistan still want to pay, to be paid attention to by the United States. But a couple years ago, and I hadn't visited this issue in a long time, to go to this war game and to see it played by the U.S. on one side and Pakistan on the other, I'm sorry, and China on the other, was really validation of what I saw even when I was there a lot, that they have a relationship where, it, where uh, China has never not been there for them. And when you ask, when I ask my, my uh, staff to go do, study what Pakistan's strategy is, now this is 2008, they came back and essentially named the strategy the fourth betrayal because we weren't there in 65 form, we weren't there in 71 form, we left in 89, and they're just waiting for us to leave again. Now that's empirical, I, I get that, I actually understand that. How do we overcome that? Back to understanding history, which is not our great strength again, but that's what they believe is gonna happen, and so I worry a great deal that this is now gonna be sort of India and the US, Pakistan and China, and it is nukes. And Whatever the ratio is, Pakistan doesn't have a chance against India just because of the conventional investment on the military side. So it's all about nukes. It's all they've got. And it really is, while we, while we may not be doing a lot about deterrence, believe me, they are because they think that's the, that's the path to their survival. And they are a perfectly paranoid country from the day they were born about India. And so where are all the political leaders and diplomats, et cetera, to try to, to try to help there? And I think a lot of that has to do, again, key is Kashmir, and a lot of it has to do with economic development in Pakistan, in addition to having a relationship from a security standpoint. Um, we, uh, just one other anecdote, when we went, to, well, they had the terrible, uh, a terrible uh, earthquake uh, in about the 04 time frame, 04 or 05. I knew the Navy One Star that went, spent weeks there working in Pakistan to help. And we couldn't have, I mean, we were doing all we could. And he said every single uh, lieutenant colonel and above in the Pakistani army had smiles on their faces when we showed up. And th they were easy to engage, and this is right up through the four stars. Uh, and that's because everybody had been to our schools. They knew where Leavenworth was. Uh, you know, they knew where Carlisle was. They'd trained down at Langley, et cetera. Every major and below never smiled. They'd never been to the U.S. So all they got was the propaganda. Um, and I gave, uh, Ann Patterson was the ambassador earlier in my time, a wonderful woman. She had, me to, to the embassy in one of my first trips to just talk to the war college about 
40 or 50 war college students, Pakistani war college students. So I talked for a few minutes and took questions. And there were two themes that jumped out of the questions. One, one I've already said. One is, what is it you don't understand about India? And, and these, were all, these were all successful officers. And the ground types, the army types, the, and the airmen had all fought you know, in Kashmir or on that border. And the other was, there wasn't a Pakistani officer that didn't know, in the, in the Pakistani military, that didn't know who Senator Pressler was. And there was not a single officer, young officer in the United States military, that had a clue who Senator Pressler was. <laughs> and for those of you that wouldn't know, the Pressler Amendment in, I think, 92, after Pakistan, Pakistan went nuke, was the amendment that cut it all off. In fact, my, my Navy counterpart came to see me in 05 or early 06, I think. And the first thing he wanted to talk about were the I think the number's right, the 14 F-16s F the United States Navy was flying at our training command in Fallon, Nevada. I didn't even know they were there. They don't forget that. So we got a long road there. They got a bunch of weapons. The trigger, quite frankly, and the controls worry me more than I'd want to say in terms of how you get to use them. And it really is the military leadership. It's really the military leadership in that country. So it's a very, very dangerous part of the world. I've got many more questions on my list, including North Korea, but I promised that we would have time for some questions from the audience. So I hope our colleagues from ACA are ready with microphones. This, the floor is open. We'll start here with uh, Alex. Is that? Uh, thank you, Admiral. That was really fascinating. We were talking earlier, and you brought it up again, that uh, these issues largely seem to have disappeared from the U.S. political uh, dialogue or discussion. And certainly we notice even among the Democratic challengers, I don't know that anyone has raised these kind of issues at all. I'm wondering, from your long experience, do you see any way of sort of bringing this back of, of some uh, engaging uh, the political dialogue in the United States to deal with these kind of issues, which I think we here all recognize are important, but the rest of the country, maybe fortunately with the end of the Cold War, doesn't anymore. I think we're at a time in our politics that if they don't generate uh, political advantages or numbers, they're not going to be talked talk about publicly, first of all. Secondly, uh, if you, I think, and I'm not a historian or I'm not a, an expert in terms of this, but if you go back through the years, during election time, the vast majority of the issues are domestic issues. So along those lines, uh, and I try to stay out of that, I'm happy to talk to anybody from either side about these issues privately and offer counsel and thoughts for, you know, in the for whatever they're worth category. But my overall sense is they just don't generate the issues themselves uh, don't generate enough uh, political, positive political outcomes for them to spend a lot of time on. That said, the irony is, flip it to January 20th of whatever year you talk about, we have a new president, and they spend 60, 70, 80 percent of their life on these issues, on you know, what I would call foreign policy, diplomatic, you know, global issues. Um, uh, so, th it, so it's important that they be smart on it. And what I would argue, and I don't know if you do this, but I would argue for ACA and others that uh, that, that you make yourself available, known to be made available to everybody that's thrown their hat in the ring to say, be, got, be glad to discuss this with you. At some point in time, you're going to need to have some expertise. We spend a lot of time on this and make that contact. And these days, you can't go too early. Uh, everybody else is going early. You ought to go early as well uh, to, to try to help inform them. Right. We'll do a question right in front here. Thank you. Uh, Ed Lamon, you were a real pathfinder uh, on the issue of U.S., Soviet, or Russian high-level military to military contacts. You yeah. re really opened that wide up. And that's not the case now, as you mentioned. Given where we are, uh, am I right to conclude that you would think if we reestablished that regular, ongoing, 
high level contact between the two militaries, that that would have value even if there's not much in the way of a robust political strategic dialogue. You know, I would not go so far as to say that one needs to precede the other. There is a lot of data historically to show that usually it does. I can do China with you for a long time here. I mean, I worked pretty hard, so did my predecessor Pete Pace and Dick Myers, to establish some kind of relationship with China. Those were fractious times, and every time we'd have an incident, the first thing the Chinese would do is cut off mill to mill. And I called, I talked to my counterpart, I said, you gotta stop doing that. I mean, we're gonna have problems. If we can't keep talking through this, we have no way to discuss it, we're never gonna get to a point where we can have serious discussions about serious issues. So one of the reasons I'm delighted that Dunford and Grasimov are talking is that at least. So I wouldn't say it's a prerequisite. I think once relations get going with a country, it's clearly critical. We absolutely have to have that part of it. Uh, and right now, I'd certainly like to see more of that than what we're seeing. What, uh, I mean, the reason, the reason I end up on the phone with Makarov in, when they go into Georgia is nobody was talking to anybody. I mean, the presidents wouldn't talk. The foreign secretary, uh, the uh, the uh, foreign minister and sex state were not talking. The national security advisors weren't talking. I get a call from Hadley going, "Okay, pick up the phone. You're going to talk to the Russian child, really?" Yeah, and obviously the news was out that this was going on, but it it proved to be a very very effective communication, and it wasn't going to happen one without our president and his president saying this is okay at that particular time. And I am, I just think it's, it's vital to have these, these kind of critical links across our government, almost, I don't want to say not having, having nothing to do with how we're getting along. We know we've got challenges. We've had challenges for a long time. They're going to continue in the future. We're going to have growing challenges with China as they grow, uh, per se. So we need to try to, to create and sustain those relationships, even if it is just to say, I still don't understand you, or I still don't agree with you. But at least I would listen to what the concerns would be, so I, as opposed to guess or read about it from uh, the media on one side or another. And those are lacking right now with Russia. I think in the very back over here, we had a hand up. Further back, did I see one? All right. All right, then. Ambassador Kennedy. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, sir. I particularly appreciated your comments about connecting up the dots between the American public foreign policy issues, including arms control. Another group I work with, Foreign Policy for America, is dedicated to, indeed, just that. But let me ask uh, a question in the nuclear field. Um, you referred to the, uh, uh, the president's uh, decision-making power on the use of nuclear weapons. Right. Congress, um, I'm thinking of Senator Markey, others uh, indeed have legislation on no first use of nuclear weapons. And I wondered if you could talk about that, your views on that. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, it, no more. It, it's almost like what Tom said earlier when you said nuclear red line. There are certain words and phrases that I came to believe from Washington, I don't even use anymore, red line being yeah, yeah. one, uh, uh, as an example. Um, climate change, which you know is another one, that, that just so quickly get you into the political arena that you almost, you almost can't have the discussion. The whole issue of no first use, and there are plenty of people that thinks that think that's where we should be. Uh, and I don't know the right answer to that, quite frankly. I'm, I certainly think it's worth the debate, but my reaction would be immediately, you know, Markey's trying to get no first use policy uh, uh, in terms of which he believes in, and is that the right answer? And is this the, is this the, uh, is this the right vehicle? And I would argue it isn't. It's a vehicle, uh, per se. So. It, you know, if let's have a debate about no first use, and and the, I think there are pros and cons to that. We've just never done it, and I'm not smart enough to know how far away we've been from that forever. It's been, it's not been our policy for a long, long time. Um, 
the, the, so the, that piece of it, you know, I don't know. I think understanding, I mean, the, the, the questions that came to me about that is the sense, and some reporting, but this sense of this happens pretty quickly. Well, while I indicated I didn't spend a ton of time on it, I spent enough time to know it happens pretty quickly. If we get to a point, and I, I get the first, and this is a different, it's a first use versus a response, there's not a lot of time. But to me, it was also immediately this political move to see if we could contain this president. That, to me, that's not the time to change the policy. I don't think that's the time, because it just gets so completely and instantly politicized, you almost can't have the debate or the discussion uh, to get to a meaningful outcome. <clears throat> I think we're out of time is what Daryl's trying to tell me uh, because we, one more. we're going to do one more. This gentleman's been very patient. Yeah. Uh, my, my name is uh, Don Kirk. I spent some time in uh, Korea. Uh, Mr. Contravene was going to ask you about Korea, but I'd like to ask you about Korea now. <laughs> what do you think of uh, CVID as opposed to step by step by step by step, and uh, where do you think we're going in this uh, debate? Thank you. Um, I guess with the uh, Koreans in particular, North Koreans, uh, I am in the you know, do not trust them and verify world, uh, and will and will stay there. First of all. Uh, the, I, I am someone that, and you would probably know, you know, Sam Nunn and I worked our way through, you know, a, a North Korean strategy document for CFR about a year, year or so before the administration came in. Uh, and the whole idea of that was to at least lay it on the table, look at options, look at the issues, et cetera. And we used a lot of North Korean and nuclear experts to put that together. Uh, and going through that, I'm, I, if you asked me to pick a camp, I'd, I would pick CVID as the goal. And so what I think the President's trying to achieve with respect to that is exactly right. And that gets back to how dangerous these weapons are. And I get, in fact, Colin, Colin Powell and I don't necessarily agree on this, because Colin says it would be suicide if this guy to use the weapon. I, I get that. I, yet. I'm also struck by the complete lack of wisdom in 33-year-olds, and I don't want to offend anybody here. Uh, <laughs> I'm just old enough to know it. While I thought I had some wisdom at 33, I understand now I didn't as I've become older. And so I've got a 33-year-old with this capability, and I wouldn't trust him. I wouldn't trust him at all. I am concerned. And, and I, I mean, part of this is I actually admire President Trump for sitting down with a guy. And you can argue that, and what happens, and this is not unusual for this president, is you know all the other conventions weren't looked at. Well, line up all the other conventions, all the other presidents, and we're nowhere with North Korea. So trying something different, and it is different. I get that. Uh, uh, I'm not, you know, I wasn't totally opposed to. It's just if in this difference and in this approach, I think you got to get to that point. Now, CVID is a. Is, is a huge undertaking uh, to get to, per se. And obviously, there'll be people that agree we ought to take it, you know, be happy with one step at a time. I'm only going to be happy with this when this guy doesn't have his, his finger on that trigger. Because I actually think of all the people I know, or I think I know, he's one, given, a, given the potential of him not being there anymore, regime change or whatever it is, I think he'd pull that trigger. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you very much, yeah, Mike. You're welcome. We really appreciate, we especially appreciate your efforts to keep the American public engaged, to keep the discussion civilized and informed. And I think that's the goal of so many other people in this room as well. So Thanks. thank you for everything, not just that you did, but that you're doing right now. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.